Good morning. Welcome to the Lord's house for worship this morning. Today as we gather, we focus on our Savior's power to overcome death and give life. The order of service that will guide our worship today is printed for you in your worship folder. Today we begin by standing and join together, joining together in the gathering rite on baptism. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. Surely we were sinful at birth, sinful from the time our mothers conceived us. But we were washed, we were sanctified, we were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. As baptized children of God, we confess our sins. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, 
and by His authority, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We pray. O oh God, the strength of all who trust in you, mercifully hear our prayers. Be gracious to us in our weakness and give us strength to keep your commandments in all we say and do. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. Our first lesson for today is taken from the Old Testament book of 1 Kings, 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 17 through 24. Here God demonstrates his power over death, his power to give life when he raised the widow's son as an answer to Elijah's prayer. We read, Sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, What do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? Give me your son, Elijah replied. He took him from her arms, carried him to the upper room where he was staying, and laid him on his bed. Then he cried out to the Lord, O Lord my God, have you brought tragedy also upon this woman? this widow I am staying with by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried to the Lord, O Lord my God, let this boy's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's cry and the boy's life returned to him and he lived. Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the room into the house. He gave him to his mother and said, Look, your son is alive. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. This is the word of the Lord. We respond to God's word today by joining together in our psalm. It's psalm number 30 on page 76.
Our second lesson for today is taken from Paul's letter to the Philippians, Philippians chapter 1, verses 18 through 26. Paul, from prison, is confident of his Savior's power to give him life so that he can continue to share the gospel. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain, and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ will overflow on account of me. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the Gospel. Our Gospel lesson for today is taken from Luke's Gospel, Luke chapter 7, verses 11 through 17. This is also the portion of God's Word that we'll consider during our sermon for today. We read, Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, Don't cry. Then he went up and touched the coffin, and those carrying it stood still. He said, Young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to, the, to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. Children, you're invited to come forward at this time to hear the children's message. We'll continue on with the next hymn.
Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, Don't cry. Dear friends in Christ, Already in my ministry, which has not been all that long, I've had plenty of opportunity to attend graveside services or to be a part of funeral processions. And there are almost always sad, heartbreaking events. One, one last time, the body of our loved one who has now fallen asleep in Christ passes before our eyes before he or she is laid to their final resting place. If there are sounds at all, it's certainly not the words of someone speaking there at the graveside. They are only muffled sobs escaping from mouths that are covered with cupped hands. People's eyes are red and stinging from all the tears they've been shedding. That moment is truly heartbreaking. And when I stand there as a pastor and I see this, I wish, I wish there was something I could do. If I could take all the pain away, I would. But I can't. I'm just a person like any one of you. But Jesus can. Jesus can and he does. In our text for today, as we experience in life, Jesus overcomes the sadness of death with the joy of eternal life. Jesus overcomes the sadness of death with the joy of eternal life. Jesus was walking in northern Gal or in Galilee, which is northern Israel. And he was walking with his disciples and a group of other people. They were following along. And he came to a town called Nain. Now Nain today is a large city, but in Jesus' day, it was a small town just south of Nazareth, his hometown. And as Jesus approached the city gate, he met a funeral procession coming out of the city. A young man had died. Now we're not told much about this man who died at all. We really don't know how old he is. We don't know how he died. We don't know what kind of person he was. The only detail we are given is that this man was the only son of his mother and she was a widow. And that's the only detail we need for us to understand just how sad and heartbreaking the death of this man was. His mother was a widow. That means once before she had felt that cold sting of death hit her life. Once before she laid to rest the body of a loved one. She lost her companion in life. She lost the father of her child. She lost her support system. Remember, this was in Jesus' day and age. This woman was a widow in a time when there was no pension. There was no social security to support her. So when she lost her husband to death, things would have seemed absolutely hopeless if it were not for one small detail. She had a son. She had a son. Things would be okay. That hole that she was feeling in her heart, she could fill it by pouring out love and nurturing on her son. Her son could grow up and become the man of the house. He would be the one who would support her and the family. Things were going to be okay. She had a son. But even now, that hope was being laid to rest. This was truly a very sad funeral procession. And I think what this portion of God's Word shows us is that, humanly speaking, death strikes when and where it wants to. See, no one escapes death. It, is, it strikes without prejudice. It doesn't matter if you're young, old, 
rich, poor, good, bad, death comes to us all. And when death hits someone who's young, like a child, or when death strikes the only son of a widow, there is something inside of us that cries out in fear and says, no fair. It shouldn't happen like this. And in those moments of fear, it feels like we are just in the hands of a God who desires to crush us, to get vengeance on us. But nothing could be further from the truth. See, death comes not because God is looking to crush us. Death becomes because we live in a sin-broken world and we ourselves are sinners. Now that doesn't mean that we can look at that widow's son and say, aha, see last week the widow's son stole bread and that's why this week he died. We don't trace death back to one specific sin usually. However, this much can be said. If this widow's son had never sinned, then he would not have died. Because death is the result of sin. And that truth of Scripture goes all the way back to the very first pages of Scripture, Genesis chapter 3. God told Adam and Eve, do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the middle of the garden, because if you do, you will die. And Adam and Eve ate. And they brought sin into the world. Adam and Eve ate. And they brought death into this world. And since Adam and Eve, every person has been born with sin, and so every person dies. And that's a truth that the Apostle Paul teaches in Romans chapter 5, where he writes, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, in this way death came to all men because all sinned. Understanding this truth of Scripture really makes death or any funeral procession really heartbreaking. Heartbreaking. It compounds the sadness because what we can admit is that really we bring it upon ourselves, don't we? Because God, God said, if you break His law at any point, the one who breaks it must die. And so death is not a cruel God looking to get vengeance and to just crush us. Death is what happens when a just and holy God and acts the punishment that he has said. And, and, that makes, and that makes it seem like our lives then are just one long, sad funeral procession from birth right to the grave. But friends, remember, Jesus overcomes the sadness of death with the joy of life, with the joy of eternal life. And we see that in our text here too. Jesus came close to this funeral procession and it says his heart went out to her. When he saw the widow, his heart went out to her. And I think that phrase is worth pondering for a few minutes. Perhaps death has struck close to home for you. And when death strikes close to home, it always leaves us rattled. Perhaps death has taken someone that you love and you are still hurting and reeling. Perhaps you still shed tears and you feel so much pain yet and you wonder when, if, it will ever stop. It seems like the rest of your friends and family have all moved on and yet for you, it is still so sad. And if that's you, please know this. Your Savior's heart goes out to you. Your Savior, Jesus, knows your pain he knows your tears and He has compassion on you. And He wants to give you joy. Joy that overcomes that sadness. The joy that is found in the promise of life. Eternal life. Jesus wanted to give that same joy to the widow. And so Jesus, as He approached the woman, said to her, Don't cry. Now, perhaps like me, you at first marvel at those words. <laughs> What do you mean, don't cry? 
If ever there was a time in this widow's life to cry, this seems like it would be the time. So why say don't cry? Is Jesus acting like a frustrated parent who has a child who's crying and finally they just get so frustrated they turn around and say, quit your whining, stop crying. Is Jesus telling this woman she's being a real downer, trying to hush up her tears? Shh, 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 don't, don't stop crying. That's enough now. No. Jesus is preparing this woman's heart for the joy he is about to give to her. He's preparing her for the fact that he's about to overcome the sadness of death with the joy of life. So Jesus walked up to the coffin and he touched it. Now I wonder if when Jesus touched the coffin, I wonder how many people gave an audible gasp. <gasps> because Jesus was a Jew. And he touched something or someone that was dead. And if you touch someone that was dead or something that contained something that was dead, it made you unclean. And this picture of clean and unclean was something that Jewish people took very seriously because it was a picture of their relationship with God. And so we have our Savior Jesus here who is willing to make himself unclean to give life. And Jesus spoke to the young man. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. And then the Bible says, the dead man sat up and began to talk. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. People have spoken to their loved ones who have passed away at their graves. I've even seen people wrap their arms around the casket and plead with the person to come back to them, not to leave them. And yet nothing happens. Because our words don't carry a power that can penetrate that barrier of death. Death proves to be too great a barrier for us to say anything to the person who has died. But Christ, Christ is life. Not only does Jesus have life within himself, and not only can he give it to others, his words give life. And his words have power, power to break that barrier of death. And so when Jesus spoke to this young man, he sat up as if Jesus had just asked him to wake up from sleep. Jesus gives life through his word. And that's true not only for that young man at Nain, he does it also for you and me. And he does it for us spiritually and physically. See, when we come into this world, we are born spiritually dead. We're just young babies, so full of life, and yet spiritually inside, there is no life there at all. But then Christ, through his word, penetrates death and gives life. For many of us, it was the word of Christ poured out on us with the waters of baptism. For others, it was the word of Christ proclaimed to us through scripture. But those words came into our dead hearts and created life there. And just as Jesus gives us spiritual life, one day he will grant us physical life. When Jesus returns, he will speak words to us, words that break the barrier of death, words that will penetrate the grave and fill our dead ears and give life to our dead bodies. That's what Jesus proclaimed in John, John chapter 5, where he said, a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear this voice, or his voice, and come out. And friends, that is how Christ overcomes the sadness of death with the joy of life. See, it's not that Jesus takes our tears away. It's not that he says, don't be sad when someone dies. Jesus overcomes the sadness of death by giving us something even greater by giving us the joy of eternal life, by promising to us that a time is coming when all who have died in Christ will be raised from the dead and we will all be gathered back together to enjoy eternity together. That's the joy that overcomes the sadness of death. And that's the joy that the Apostle Paul wanted the Thessalonians to feel. And so he wrote to them and said, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. 
We believe that Jesus died and rose again. So we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. Give joy to each other with these words. Friends, you and I can be certain of Christ's promises of eternal life because he himself died and rose again. When Jesus died, he overcame sin. He forgave it all. Sin, which is what makes death so sad and so permanent for us, it has been removed by Christ. And not only did Jesus die for our sins, but he also rose again. And when Jesus rose, he proved that he has life and power over death, and he has the authority to give us life. So yes, we can trust Christ. Because he lived, died, and rose again. Now when Jesus did this miracle outside Nain, all who witnessed it praised God, saying that a prophet has appeared in their midst. You and I believe that Jesus is more than a prophet, don't we? We believe that he is the Son of God. That he is true God and true man. And we believe that Jesus gives life. That he's given to us spiritual life and a time is coming where he will give us physical, eternal life. And that is a promise that we hold on to in every circumstance of life. And so when the time comes and we find ourselves standing at the graveside of a loved one, even if we don't get that person back the same way that the widow at Nain got her son back, we know that we still have joy, joy that overcomes even all the tears that are flowing at that moment. For we know that all who die in Christ live eternally with him in heaven. And we know that a time is coming when Christ will raise us and all the dead and bring us to be together with him in heaven forever. That is a promise that overcomes the sadness of death. It is the promise of eternal life. Amen. Please stand. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, give your hearts and minds, or keep your hearts and minds, in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us continue by confessing the unity of our faith by speaking the words of the Apostles' Creed. We confess... I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We continue by giving our offerings to the Lord. Also, please take a moment to fill out the friendship register and pass that down to the person next to you in the pew. Please stand for prayer. Lord, we give thee but thine own, whatever the gifts may be. All that we have is thine alone, a trust, O Lord, from thee. May we thy bounties thus, as stewards true receive, and gladly as thou bless us, to thee our first fruits give. Amen.
we'll join together in the printed responsive prayer of the church, but we also have two special prayer requests for today. Uh, the first is for the family of Elroy Moss. Elroy's father, Elroy Moss Sr., passed away last week, and so we pray for the family. We also pray for Audrey Elsie, who underwent surgery and is recovering. So we have a prayer of thanksgiving. Lord God, our maker and preserver, we praise and thank you for all that you give us day after day. You have given us your precious word to nourish our souls and to protect us from the temptations of the devil, the world, and our sinful nature. Heavenly Father, we pray that you shield us from every kind of danger, sudden catastrophe, terrors of crime, and the pain of disease. Watch over those who travel by land, sea, and air. Keep our loved ones from whatever perils may threaten them. Bless our land, our people, and those who hold offices of high trust. Keep our government and schools upright and strong for the advancement of good citizenship and useful vocations, that we may enjoy your gifts of peace, security, and well-being. Our loving and saving God, we thank you for all the mercies with which you blessed Elroy Moss Sr., who according to your goodwill has now fallen asleep in you. We thank you especially for the spiritual blessings you brought him through baptism and that you preserved his faith through your gospel in word and sacrament. We ask you to bring your comfort and peace to his family and to all others who mourn for him. Support them and give them spiritual strength through the promise of the resurrection and the glorious life to come. Lord, you are the giver of life, health, safety, and strength. We praise you for the strength that you have provided Audrey Elzey. Thank you for being with her doctors and for giving success to her surgery. Please be with Audrey as she continues to recover, and may she daily remember your great goodness. Lead her and all of us to live in a way that demonstrates genuine, genuine thankfulness for all of your blessings. We bring these requests before you in the name of Jesus our Lord and ask you to hear us. Take all that we have, our bodies and minds, our time and skills, our ministries and offerings, and use them to your glory. <clears throat> Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. O Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation. <clears throat> and bestow on us your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace.
You may be seated as we join together in our closing hymn. Good morning once again. Good to see all of you here this morning. My pleasure to share God's Word with you today. Uh, just a couple of announcements I want to point out to you. In your, in your announcements page, um, please look at the results from our June 9th voters meeting. We want to make sure everybody understands um, the resolution that was passed in regards to our, our budget for the next year. And then um, also, just an invitation. Uh, n this coming Thursday is our 4th of July parade here in town. Um, our evangelism committee will have a presence in the parade uh, promoting our vacation Bible school. If you'd like to be a friendly face for Trinity and walk along, we'll have a nice bright t-shirt you can wear, and we certainly would appreciate your participation. So um, if you'd like to do that, please speak with me or any of the members of our board of evangelism. 
May the Lord bless your day.